The video which you are about to see is an account of a small group of filmmakers in the area of Austin, Texas in the summer of 1973. Their intent was to make a motion picture to which was unlike anything ever seen. For them, the idyllic summer shoot became a nightmare from the low budget, sweltering Texas heat, and the treacheries from fraudulent investors. The events of that summer were led to the release of one of the most terrifying films in the annals of cinema history, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Have you ever had a conversation with friends or even made the occasional Google search on what would be considered the scariest movie of all time? At a very young age, that would be the question I would often ask my older siblings. I would get answers like The Exorcist, The Amityville Horror, The Shining, The Fog, Halloween, etc. And I would seek those out hoping to find one that would challenge myself to keep me up at night. However, there was one which wasn't suggested to me, and I happened to find it in my sister's room in a blockbuster case with a big sticker which said, Youth Restricted Viewing, followed by the most intriguing name I've ever heard at the time. I didn't see the movie then, but that restricted sticker felt so forbidden that I had to seek it out. A couple years later, I did, but more on that later. For now, be wary of any hitchhikers on the way to the slaughterhouse as we dive into the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The concept for the film came from the mind of Texas native Toby Hooper. Hooper was born in Austin, Texas to parents who ran a hotel business in the regional area and would often move from hotel to hotel there, he would frequent movie theaters which would act as a temporary babysitter. His love for movies would lead him to picking up his father's 8mm camera and at the age of 16, he made his first sound film. At that moment, he realized he wanted to be a filmmaker, something I can heavily relate to myself having made several short films on VHS camcorder I purchased from a pawn shop while in high school. He would go on to teaching at the University of Texas in Austin and make several documentaries one of which was on Peter, Paul, and Mary. You like Peter, Paul, and Mary? Yes, I do. But documentaries weren't enough for this movie buff, and he took a shot with his first feature film, the experimental hippie film Eggshells in 1969. Eggshells was mainly shown throughout universities, as many experimental films at the time would tend to do, but he wanted to aim even higher. He wanted a film that would be his calling, one which would get his name out in Hollywood. For many first-time filmmakers, especially those working with basically no budget, the easiest genre to take on is horror. With horror, you don't need big stars or a big budget. Just a good story and a little expertise in movie making. And that's exactly what Toby Hooper had. From studying films at a young age to picking up his first camera, his life led to this moment. Inspired by the events of Plainfield, Wisconsin murderer Ed Gein, as well as the graphic violence portrayed from local news outlets, Hooper and Eggshell's co-writer, Kim Hinkle, began crafting the story under the names Head Cheese and Leatherface. It wasn't until after the shooting that the title would be changed. I will not see this nothing by that name. I said, uh, that's, that's it. That's the title. The film follows a group of friends, Sally and her brother Franklin, her boyfriend Jerry, and their friends Kirk and Pam, traveling through rural Texas to investigate the possible vandalism of Sally and Franklin's grandfather's grave. Along the way, they encounter a crazed hitchhiker who ends up cutting Franklin with a knife. After kicking him out and running low on gas, they stop off at a local rundown gas station and barbecue joint. While waiting for the gas tankers to show up to refuel the pumps, the gang head to Sally and Franklin's old family homestead, going against the advice of the owner of the gas station. Upon investigating the house, they soon realize something terrible has happened there and they aren't alone. Suddenly, one by one, they are attacked by a chainsaw-wielding maniac known to us as Leatherface, a brutal, hulking man who wears the skin of his victims as a mask. He is accompanied by his cannibalistic and psychotic family, including the deranged hitchhiker, who aid him in his work. When writing the story, they wanted to focus on the attention on how dysfunctional America had become. Horror at the time had begun to age out of the standard spooks and ghost stories and invaders from outer space to acting as a commentary on the state of the world. Night of the Living Dead helped set this precedence on this new wave of filmmaking by not setting it in the past, 
but rather the present with the horror reflecting as a criticism on the rage people felt in the 60s. This paved way to other low budget and grimy horror films to give their ire a message, such as Wes Craven's The Last House on the Left. But Hooper and Hinkle wanted to take their film a step further by having an even greater terror happen in their home state. With Texas being so spread out, they felt like anything could happen in the more rural parts of the Lone Star State. It's like I was always, you know, in, in Texas, always lived in the city. And, and, and out there got kind of scary. Together, the two men created Vortex to handle the production side of the film and, with the help of a friend, formed MAB to handle all investments. Bill Parsley, a friend of Hooper's, ran MAB and invested $60,000 into the film, and in return, the rights would be split 50-50, and it would have distribution secured by Bryanston Distribution. We'll come back to that in a minute. With funds secured, next up was gathering up his cast and crew. At the time, Hooper was one of the few filmmakers in Austin who had actually made a feature film, so naturally, the locals would be eager to work with him. Marilyn Burns, who appears as the film's final girl Sally, was on the film commission board in Texas and had been trying to bring in more productions to be made in the state. And when she found out a young guy who made this little film called Eggshells was prepping a horror picture, she jumped right on it. With most of his cast in place, the next one to cast would be one of the most iconic characters to ever grace the screen. What makes a great cinematic villain is not only the way the character is written, but also how the character is portrayed on screen. Imitators can be memorable, sure, but mostly that memory would last for the 90 minutes you spend on the film and maybe on your drive home. But the great ones are the ones people talk about decades later. Freddy, Jason, Chucky, Ghostface, the ones you proudly wear on your t-shirts or have tattooed on your skin. And Leatherface is no different. And it was Gunnar Hansen's understanding of the character that really made it work. But it almost wasn't the case. Fresh out of graduate school at UT Austin, Hansen learned of a horror film being made in this town and decided to audition. Even though they thought he was perfect for the role, unfortunately, the role had already been cast. Weeks later, while walking through town, Cooper bumped into him and informed the actor who was chosen was drunk in a hotel room and wouldn't come out. Seeing as they were desperate and running out of time, Hansen took the role. He saw Leatherface more than just some psychotic killer. Yes, he's the biggest and strongest and most violent, but he also saw him as the most frightened character, a man with an intellectual disability who had probably been abused by his family to assume a more feminine role. So naturally, he freaks out when these random strangers enter his home. So what I did was I went to a, a state school, which was a residential community, a campus community for retarded persons. And I, I just spent these two days on the campus walking around watching the way people moved. Lastly, while some of the cast had a slight boost in their careers due to this film, one ended up having a lasting career in film and television, the narrator, John Larroquette. Larroquette at the time of filming was a radio DJ in Hollywood and ended up providing the narration to the opening scroll for the simple payment of marijuana. Which makes me wonder if that was still his payment for the other two times he provided narration for the other films in the series. Filming went underway in August of 1973. Having lived in that area for five years with the car with no AC, I can tell you that the heat in Texas is no picnic. And those problems would plague the cast and crew. Due to its extreme low budget and the cost of equipment rentals, filming had to go underway for seven days a week with about 16 hour days. The bus driven by the core group of friends belonged to sound recordist Ted Niccolo, which was purchased by him to carry more equipment in hopes more jobs would come. Since his van was there every day, he agreed to rent it out to Toby for the shoot. The cramped and enclosed set only added to the frustrations due to the scorching heat. As for Hansen, the low budget meant there was only one costume for Leatherface. So to keep continuity for the grime and blood on his costume, he was not allowed to wash it. 12 to 16 hours a day for a month wearing the same costume? You can see where I'm going with this. Another thing this film really excels at is set decoration from both casting director and art director Robert A. Burns. His commitment to the film was so remarkable that the shot you see of the armadillo roadkill happened to be a happy accident. Originally, the script called for a dead dog, but while driving, Burns saw this armadillo on the side of the road and took it home. He then got a book on taxidermy and tested it out. He would also gather up remains from dead cattle on various farms. Dorothy Pearl, who handled makeup, 
used to work for a veterinarian and knew of bone yards for other animals. Using all his resources, Burns designed all the pieces seen, including the infamous mask donned by Leatherface. When you watch the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you may walk out thinking you have seen a non-stop brutal gore fest, but in reality, there is very little blood. For instance, when Pam is being hung on the meat hook, the camera cuts away and only implies the hook went through. This was all because of Burns, as he suggested if you show the trick, audiences would want to know how you did it. It's the classic less is more and leaving everything up to the imagination. In fact, Hooper would get in touch with the MPAA to see how he would get away with certain things to achieve a PG rating. Heat was not the only problem with the shoot. Again, due to low funds coming in, required real props used. Yes, a real chainsaw, a very real hammer which actually struck one of the actors by accident, and Marilyn Burns being tied to a chair at the dinner scene. That particular scene ended up being a 27 hour shoot due to they were losing one of the actors to another film and running out of appliances for the grandfather played by 19 year old John Dugan. The room had no ventilation with curtains blocking the windows to prevent light from shining in and real food was placed on the table which began to rot. Top that off with the stench from Hansen's costume and frantic acting would easily make it an uneasy situation for anyone. To all my future filmmakers out there, do not follow the steps taken making this film. As a production, it was a very abusive production and you see things you don't want to do like working 27 hour days just because you didn't have your shit together enough to shoot it all in one day, which you should have known you could if you'd have planned it. On top of that, no one was getting paid. Prior to filming, the production manager promised the cast and crew points from the share of profits made from the film. However, no one realized half of those shares from Vortex had been sold to MAB meaning their shares would only be half as well. With Paul A. Partain, who played Franklin, when it came to his final shot of him rolling down the hill off his wheelchair, he refused to do another take until he was paid what he was promised. Here's the deal. Either I get paid or you get some other fat boy to go down the hill. So I met with Ron Bozeman. So they cut him a check then and there, and when you see him tumbling down the hill, there's a check in his front pocket of his pay in full. So the filming was grueling, and seemingly unprofessional, but we all know how the film became a big success and had a happy ending, right? Well, let's jump back to Bryanston distribution. After almost a year of editing and sound mixing, and a ballooning of the budget which resulted in more percentages taken from Vortex, Hooper began showing his film to several distributors who all passed on the project. One of the few offered to buy the film on the spot. Bryanston distribution, headed by Louis Perino. Why is that name so important, you may ask yourself? Well, apart from distributing films like Deep Throat, Pereno was one of the sons of the Colombo crime family, a known mafia. Bryanston did indeed release the film, which would become a huge success, for Bryanston anyways. However, the cast and crew were all watching these numbers being brought in, hoping to expect a hell of a payday. But, due to Bryanston's false reporting of actual profits and the constant sell and shares of Vortex, which the cast and crew was promised, their checks didn't amount to much. Gunnar Hansen's first check amounted to $47. So naturally, the filmmakers sued. However, at the time of suing, Bryanston was going into bankruptcy and ended up settling out of court until the rights were sold to New Line Cinema, who eventually paid the producers more. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre in itself is a piece of cinematic art, one that is now preserved in the American film archives, but his art definitely came with the price of sanity during production. So how did I finally see it? Well, as a kid, there was this local mom and pop video store in a small town in South Carolina that didn't really care how old you are when it came to renting movies. So once I found this out, the first film I checked out was this very movie, the one I was told by Blockbuster I was forbidden to see. My best friend and I had to hide this from our parents, and the only place we knew no one would find us was a local church which we had the keys to. That's right, my first experience with a film which claimed to chronicle one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history was in a church. And to this day, I still stand by my statement, it is indeed the most horrific, yet absurdly funny, movie to ever exist. So I ask you, fellow viewers, where were you when you first watched this film? Do you consider it one of the scariest movies ever made? 
with often overlooked black humor, or is it just a film of its time? In 1974, one of the most revered and controversial horror films of all time was released. It would introduce the world to a chainsaw-wielding madman known as Leatherface. With the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, critics would applaud its use of atmosphere and lack of gore to underline the complete terror that audiences would endure while watching it. The stark brutality froze audiences to their very core. One thing no one really seemed to comment on was the film's use of black humor throughout. Director Toby Hooper seemed to think the film was hilarious, but no one else seemed to pick up on that. When he was approached by Canon Films about doing a sequel, he decided he would make the dark humor the main focus of the film this time around so that it couldn't be ignored. Hooper decided the movie needed to also embrace the trend of the times to throw in a lot of blood and gore. What would ensue has divided horror fans ever since. Let's find out on what the f happened to this horror movie. I want to thank you guys for watching What the F*** Happened to This Horror Movie and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now, like this video, and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now, back to the show. After the first Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Toby Hooper went on to direct other notable horror properties like Eaten Alive, Life Force, and Poltergeist, so it seemed he had left Texas Chainsaw Massacre behind. He eventually would come back around to the idea of a sequel and what that would look like. Hooper would hit up genre studio Canon Films to pitch his ideas. Canon was so excited to get into the Texas Chainsaw Massacre business that it said that the studio head Menahem Golden greenlit the movie after only hearing the first five lines of the pitch. This wouldn't last, as after hearing the full pitch, they would turn the idea down. At first, Hooper pitched an idea of an entire town of cannibals which would satirize the film Motel Hell. This was a full circle moment, as that film was a satire of the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The title he had in mind was Beyond the Valley of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The studio was not impressed and rejected that idea. Eventually, Hooper brought in L.M. Kit Carson to help him come up with ideas for the movie. After a short time, they finally nailed down what would become Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. In the film, the Sawyer family returns to wreak havoc on Texas once again. Well, out one night, a couple of guys use their fancy car phone to call into a radio station. During the call, they run afoul of Leatherface and he cuts them to pieces live on the air. The radio DJ Stretch has the call on tape and tries to convince a local Texas Ranger named Lefty that this is the Sawyer family. Lefty turns out to be the uncle of Sally and Franklin from the first film. He gets her to play the tape on the radio again to try and bring out the cannibalistic family. It works a little too well, as a guy named Chop Top and Leatherface himself visit Stretch at the station. After they kill her co-worker, LG, Leatherface develops a crush on her and lets her live, while indicating to Chop Top that he had killed her. They leave, and Stretch follows them to an abandoned amusement park. It just so happens that Lefty is also on his way there, and both enter to confront the Sawyer family and hopefully end their killing spree for all time. Hooper had no intention of directing the film and had only intended to come on board as a producer. Once the budget started to get slashed, which seems to have happened a lot on Canon films, he realized he was going to have to direct it as they couldn't afford to hire anyone else. Even through filming, the budget would keep getting changed. This seemed to reflect on how well other Canon films seemed to be doing at the moment. One week, they were doing well, so the budget would go up. The next week, another film wasn't doing so good, so the budget got cut. It was a strange back and forth that caused a lot of confusion on the film set. When putting together the cast, they first went to the original Leatherface, Gunnar Hansen. He claims that the studio offered him scale plus 10% to cover his agent fee. When he told them he didn't have an agent, they then dropped the offer down to just scale. He would turn the role down, saying the offer was too low. Unit publicist Scott Holton refutes this, saying that Hansen wavered on taking the part and eventually the studio rescinded the offer. Either way, it meant we were getting a new Leatherface. One person Toby Hooper had kept in mind, if he ever did a sequel, was Bill Mosley. He was a huge fan of the original film, and even went so far as to film a short film called The Texas Chainsaw Manicure. In it, 
he played the hitchhiker character from the original film. He showed it to some screenwriting friends, one of which knew Hooper. He asked if he could show it to him, and Mosley let him. Hooper ended up loving it and told Mosley that if he ever did a sequel, that he would keep him in mind for a part. When it came time to make the sequel, he offered the part of Chop Top to Mosley. He is actually supposed to be the twin brother of the hitchhiker. In the film, you can see Mosley and Leatherface carry around the now dried up and long dead body of the hitchhiker throughout the movie. Dennis Hopper was brought in to play the character of Lefty. He would claim afterwards that it was the worst film he ever made. At least, that was until Super Mario Brothers in 1993. His character's high energy during the journey through the abandoned amusement park kept the film moving. And really, who doesn't want to see Dennis Hopper have a chainsaw fight with Leatherface? The image of him wielding two small chainsaws like revolvers is what cinema gold is made of. There was a deleted storyline that we learned that Lefty is actually Stretch's father. The pacing issues and unneeded relationship between the characters made Hooper drop it. It wasn't a complete through line in the film as it was barely noticeable after it had been taken out. One person who was cut out of the film, pun intended, was genre film historian Joe Bob Briggs. He showed up in a small cameo, but was ultimately cut from the movie. Briggs has been a big supporter of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise. He calls the first film the greatest movie ever made and gave a favorable review to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Next Generation. He did, however, say that part three wimped out due to the amount of editing made to get an R rating. After the film had been going on for a short time, Cannon began to worry that the production was taking too long and going over budget. They sent Newt Arnold down to keep an eye on things. He had a bunch of different jobs on various movie sets, but on this one, he seemed to be strictly the eyes and ears of the studio. They wanted to make sure that things were getting done quicker, but with fewer takes. He must have done a good job, as they would later let him direct the film Bloodsport. If only we could have gotten a Jean-Claude Van Damme Leatherface crossover. One of the things the studio must not have been happy with is that one night in Austin, the building they were using for the production caught fire. The fire department showed up to do their job and to their dismay found a building with all sorts of dismembered body parts and skeletons. They thought they had stumbled upon the lair of a serial killer. I'm sure they were relieved to know it was just Leatherface and his cannibalistic family. Finally, the film was finished and sent off to the MPAA for rating. Of course, they slapped it with an X rating. After a lot of back and forth, it was obvious that nothing they could do was gonna make the MPAA happy. So the film instead was released unrated. This could have caused issues with getting an R rating for part three, as the MPAA seems to hold a grudge. When the film did finally hit theaters, fans of the original were let down. They thought Hooper had taken this bleak, dead serious film and turned it into a comedy. Hooper attests that he just ramped up the dark humor of the original. He says the humor was always there, but because of the shocking content of the first one, it was completely overshadowed. Here, he kept the focus on it and it shines through. It eventually would find its own audience among the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise. Someone who felt like the film lived on outside of its original release is Caroline Williams. She loved playing the character of Stretch and has shared that she still does even if no one realizes it. While not official, because then people have to be paid money, she claims the character has shown up in other films and even in other Texas Chainsaw movies. While talking to Dread Central, she ran down where Stretch has been seen since Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. The character actually shows up in Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. Director Jeff Bird told her, quote, Look, I don't know how long these chainsaw films will carry on, but I want to keep your character alive. I don't want to get rid of you. You are not mentioned anywhere in this screenplay, but I want to make sure that for the ages, if anybody wants to revisit Stretch, it has to be you. You will be seen in part three. The fans will know it's you. After that, she stopped by the New Orleans Swamp in Hatchet 3. She said, while talking with the director, quote, BJ McDonald told me, she's Stretch. That's what you're doing here. I played the character of Amanda precisely, as she would be. Stretch grew up, she changed her name, she married a law enforcement guy played by Zach Galligan, and she split because she's a woman who is obsessed with pursuing these legends, these myths, which in her mind are not myths. And if you're a fan of the Sharknado films, she does appear as a character named Stretch in Sharknado 4. So how is that for a horror movie cinematic universe? 
While it's not a huge cultural milestone like the original, it did speak on themes of the times. It expanded the Sawyer family out of their Texas home and into the world, which may be scarier. Rather than accidentally stumbling upon the family after your car breaks down, they could be your neighbors. That chainsaw you hear in your neighborhood early on a Sunday morning while you're trying to sleep, that could be Leatherface doing more than cutting people limb from limb. He's robbing you from sleeping in on your day off. What can I say about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre that hasn't already been said? It's a well-deserved classic, the grandfather of the slasher genre that shook the innocent American minds in 1974. How many times have you heard how bloody this film is? Except that it isn't. Intense? Sure. Its visual, unrelenting approach hints at more than it actually shows. <laughs> This sweaty, saturated 16mm shot film changed the game and still holds up as an effective nail-biting exercise in tension. Years later, writer and director Toby Hooper signed a three-picture deal with the Lords of Schlock over at Canon Films, with the contract stating that one out of the three films must be a sequel to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Going the route that Evil Dead 2 and Gremlins 2 would be applauded for later on, Chainsaw 2 leaned heavily into its humor and went bigger, more zany. <laughs> oh, no. Though a success financially, Cannon wanted a horror movie, but instead got a black comedy. Hooper was done with the series he created and went on to other projects. But as the saying goes, money talks and bullshit walks, and no one leaves money on the table. So four years later, New Line acquired the rights and went on resurrecting the well-known IP with Leatherface, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. Now back then, New Line was on top of the genre during the late 80s and early 90s, making it big with Nightmare on Elm Street. They also went on to acquire Jason Voorhees and finally, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But since you're here with me, you know that uh, things really weren't perfectly splendid. And like every other entry here, became either mangled, changed, picked apart, or f***ed. So let's drive into the blood and guts of Leatherface, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, and ask, what the f*** happened to this horror movie? As the first became a genre classic, with the character of Leatherface starting the big six, and the sequel making good money, it was clear there was an audience that wanted more. New Line realized that a new sequel that would harken back to the tone of the original could potentially be a big money maker. Enter New Line Cinema's Mike DeLuca, a big fan and a lover of the horror genre. He pushed for a more commercial, yet modest budget film, somewhere financially between parts one and two, that would stay more authentically true to what had come before and hopefully spawn a new series of sequels. New Line impatiently went full steam ahead without even hiring a director. An idea? Check. A designer? Yeah, check. A director to hone the specific vision? Eh, no need. And after a short list of potential directors, and at the 11th hour, Jeff Burr was eventually chosen. Now, funny enough, Peter Jackson was on said list. You see, New Line liked Jackson and nearly used his script for the then-supposed franchise swan song, Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. Before that script is chosen, New Line let him take a crack at it with his script, A Nightmare on Elm Street 6, The Dream Lover. The point is New Line wanted to offer Jackson directing duties on good faith, but ended up going with Jeff Burr, who was coming off the successful sequel, The Stepfather Part 2, starring the excellent and always amazing Terry O'Quinn. Before Burr was even hired, New Line jumped the gun and put out a teaser trailer of footage that wouldn't be included in the film. Sort of how bands would release an EP with a song that wouldn't be included on the album, but would hint at tone and style. The same thing here. Only this trailer, which is pretty badass by the way, features none other than the best Jason Voorhees himself, in my humble opinion. Kane motherfucking hotter as Leatherface. Quick trivia. Kane would end up as a stunt double for R.A. Hmm. Mihailov? 
One thing, among others, that Burr found frustrating was that Part 3 couldn't be its own thing. Even back then, a single story wasn't the idea, but to set up more sequels. I mean, I, mean, I don't know why. Is the expectation and the idea that the film can't function just as a film, it's got to function as a kickoff to more films. To get their specific vision, Splatterpunk author David Scow, who ironically almost wrote Nightmare on Elm Street 5, with his mock-up, Freddy Rules, being considered for what would eventually become the dream child. Scow was hired to bring the franchise back to its roots. Or as he said himself, just kind of tip the hat, but not Xerox the first movie. Leatherface was conceived with the intention of making what every American evangelist claimed about the original. A nasty, mean, bloody movie. And to me, what sounds like a good time. Remember this for later, but Part 3's entire existence was to go mean, messy, and over the top. To go where the franchise has really always belonged. David Scow got to work revisiting the original to find the seeds he needed to grow his own story while keeping it true to what came before. His first order of business was to get rid of the original Sawyer family and implement an adopted nuclear family, a group of misfits who are bound by their murderous tendencies and not by blood. Well, I guess they are bound by blood, but what I mean is they won't be related. The plan was to disregard the sequel and aim for a reboot, yet sequel-ish, that nodded to previous entries, but in more of an easter egg way. I mean, it's a film equivalent of having your cake and eating it too. Hence, Stretch has a cameo, as herself, who is now leveled up as a reporter, despite Part 2 being erased from this timeline. Not wanting to cast any big stars, they went with genre staples and some great indie newcomers. I mean, look at a young Viggo Mortensen. What I like about Tex is that he plays it in a kind of a sensitive way, and who may be putting on sort of a tough guy facade. I wish you'd call me Tex. I told you. <laughs> I'm sorry, boy. Yeah, damn it, I'm sorry. Kate Hodge plays an excellent Scream Queen, with a perfect amount of vulnerability but could still stand tall when the situation arises. The legendary Ken Foray was added because of his genre appeal, and fit the character of Benny, a young Tina from Friday the 13th Part 7 The New Blood, shows up as a little girl who may be Leatherface's daughter, according to Mihailov. The cast was set and shooting was a hustle. Being shot in California, as every other chance that film was rightfully shot in Texas prior, made for some difficulties. Some sets were built prior to Burr being hired, while sets for the last two thirds of the film were not. So Burr had to kind of find a way to shoot around what was already given to him. Most of the film was shot in a place in California called the New Hall Ranch, which is located stupidly close to Magic Mountain. And you could actually hear faint screams of kids on roller coasters in some scenes in the VHS version. Though New Line hired Burr, it was clear right into shooting they didn't like him. Like the micromanaging c**ts they are, New Line's lackeys came down on Burr for the smallest thing. Word in the street has it that he wanted to make this gory, as was the plan all along, but New Line got cold feet and found every excuse to undermine him. That and the constant pressure to keep on schedule as any minute over wouldn't be tolerated. Now, knowing that every movie needs some sort of reshoots, they wouldn't give Burr any wiggle room, not even an inch. Going as far as asking him for his shot list for the upcoming week, or he'd be fired. Now, New Line actually fired Burr because they didn't think he was fast enough. And even though it was clear that he was, he wasn't behind schedule, they just didn't trust him. Thinking that they could quickly get a new director to step into the ongoing production was a foolish mistake. And two days later, they rehired him. The stipulations were basically that time was key, and he had to cut down the gore, which they previously agreed to, to get this production wrapped up to meet the November 3rd premiere. The second in command at New Line hated the film, found it to be trashy and offensive. Surprisingly, the test screening was positive, but they got the unfortunate news that in its current state, Chainsaw 3 would be banned overseas. And so the second sequel was about to get the sweet kiss of death from the MPAA who gave the first cut the dreaded X, which caused quite a controversy. Knowing that the film always had to get an R rating, Burr submitted Chainsaw 3 over 11 times, with a few notable cuts. The Sarah character is bisected by the chainsaw, with even Greg Nicotero holding below the blood pump and the body rig. That was just turned into a chainsaw stab. There's a scene where the little girl kills Ryan with a sledgehammer pulley system, which the MPAA thought was a step too far, having a kid basically murder somebody, and cut it in an awkward way where she just seems to be there. Tex, charred to a crisp, gets impaled by one of the family's own traps. And a lot more like that, a lot of brute force. 
blood squibs, just kind of like that, that, that salt and pepper kind of gore you need in a film was cut to the bone. They even reshot Benny's death, which was uh, pretty permanent, where Benny saves a day and him and Michelle ride off into the southwest sun. New Line even went behind Burr's back and shot a whole different ending. Rumor has it that Burr didn't even know they changed the ending until he saw it himself in theaters. Where Burr's original ending had Michelle see the little girl in the back of the police squad, realizing that it never ends and that more are involved. Because of these cuts and alterations, Chainsaw 3 missed its November release dates and ended up being dumped in January, debuting at number 11. Critics and audiences hated it. They felt New Line betrayed them. And even after all the cuts, it was still banned in many overseas countries, including England. As the first non-Toby Hooper sequel, it was seen as sadistic and mean, unneeded. Now, Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3 in its purest form is what it was always meant to be, a mean, bloodier, and more polished companion piece to the original. It took up until 2018 to finally get an unrated, cleaned up Blu-ray edition. I'm glad to say that Chainsaw 3 was finally course corrected and that the true vision of Jeff Burr can be seen in HD glory. And it's a badass movie. Pretty goddamn good, you backwoods motherfucker. That was always just trying to entertain. Fans were hyped when it was announced that Kim Henkel, co-writer of the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, was taking the helm of the fourth film in the franchise and promising to deliver something along the lines of the first movie, a scary, down-and-dirty, independent film shot in Texas. So when Henkel's Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Next Generation, was finally released, years after production had wrapped, and the audience that had been waiting so long saw that the movie was packed with ridiculous, over-the-top characters, and hence that the Backwoods family at the heart of the series were actually working for the Illuminati. It made many of us ask, what the fuck happened to this horror movie? You won't see the name Robert Kuhn anywhere on Toby Hooper's 1974 classic, but the Austin-based lawyer was instrumental in getting the movie made. He's one of the film's investors and the filmmaker's legal advisor, helping them form the production company and the investor corporation. As the franchise moved forward, he retained a financial interest in it, and when one of the other rights holders died, he bought that person's chainsaw interest. So when he approached Hooper's Chainsaw co-writer, Kim Henkel, about getting a new sequel into production, they already had, by Kuhn's estimation, around 80 to 90 percent of the franchise rights secured, since Henkel was president of the corporation that owned half of the rights. Although New Line Cinema had put their best effort to turn Chainsaw into a major Hollywood moneymaker, with 1990's Leatherface, a Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, which is a pretty good time, honestly. The film had been a box office failure, so New Line abandoned their plans to make multiple movies, and the rest is history. Now, Kuhn wanted to make sure the series wouldn't go dormant, and he was tired of letting companies like Canon and New Line make sequels, since he hadn't been happy with the results. For his part, Henkel didn't seem really pleased with any of the Chainsaw movies to date. He wasn't quite sure what fans and critics saw in the original. It was nothing but a crude backyard movie that a bunch of kids slapped together. His quote, not mine. As far as he was concerned, he could only see the flaws when he watched it. He felt that Hooper's version had been compromised on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. In part 3, well, he and Kuhn agreed that that one was a disappointment. Still, he wasn't enthusiastic about making one of these movies himself. It took years to convince him to write the screenplay for the fourth film. And more pushing was required to get him to agree to make his feature directorial debut with Chainsaw 4. And decades later, The Next Generation remains Henkel's only directing credit. The title in the script Henkel wrote was Return of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He didn't want a number in the title to mark this as just another sequel. He didn't care to address the events of Part 2 and 3. His objective here was to revitalize the franchise with the real sequel following the structure of the original film and featuring some similar characters. Kind of like what the Halloween franchise has been doing for years. 
For example, one of Leatherface's family members in Henkel's film is W.E., who is essentially the cook from the original and part two uh, all over again. In fact, he might be the same person since he runs a gas station, just like the cook did. And even though part two said the cook's name was Drayton Sawyer, the sign on the gas station in the first movie implies his name was W.E. Slaughter. It has been said that the original actor was offered the chance to reprise the role of the cook, but turned it down. Instead, the role went to Joe Stevens. W.E.'s dialogue consists largely of historical and literary quotes, a character element that was inspired by a strange argument Henkel witnessed between the Texas Chainsaw Massacre assistant cameraman, who also played LG in part two, and Perryman's father, who kept dropping quotes in the middle of their fight. <laughs> Gunnar Hansen, the original Leatherface, was approached to return as well, but he was asking for about $3,500 a week. The low-budget production refused to offer him any more than $600, so Hansen chose to refuse. Hankel went then searching for someone who was more of an androgynous type. Since he intended to play up the fact that Leatherface portrays different genders, depending on which human skin mask is being worn at any given moment. The search ended when he found Robert Jacks, who was also a musician and contributed some music to the film, a song he wrote and performed with Blondie's Debbie Harry. Chainsaw 4 was filmed just outside of Austin, Texas, and nearly every cast member was a local. Most of the cast were unknowns and still are to this day, but there are a couple standouts who had quickly become big-time Hollywood stars. Meth McConaughey and Renee Zellweger. By the time they came aboard, they had both been in the Richard Linklater classic Days and Confused. McConaughey had a prominent and memorable role, while looking for Zellweger in the movie is like playing Where's Waldo. McConaughey was originally looking at playing a smaller role in Chainsaw. A handsome biker character would have a scene early on and then reappear at the end to ride off into the sunset with our heroine. A role that ended up being cut entirely, so when we do see a motorcycle in the finished film, it's just a random passerby. -er. McConaughey thought he wouldn't have time to play a larger part because he was planning to move out to Hollywood soon. But, but on second thought, he decided to stay in Texas a while longer to play the most insane character in the film, a truck driver named Vilmer. As troubled as this movie turned out to be, McConaughey's Vilmer is one of its highlights. He really put his all into making sure the character came off as dangerous and unhinged as possible. And here we go! <laughs> And the result is a performance that even gets praise from viewers who hate everything else about the movie. While speaking with Fangoria magazine, Henkel put down the original villains from the Chainsaw film as outlandish and buffoonish, saying the villains in his movie would be more credible and thus more frightening. That is not the case. But McConaughey certainly tried. Zellweger was cast as a heroine Jenny, a mousy girl with a bad home life who gradually finds her inner strength as the film goes along. Jenny and her peers, who become victims, cross paths with the family on prom night because Henkel figured you can't get more American than teenagers on prom night. And it's these teen characters who gave the viewers the first hint that this film was not going to live up to the quality of the original. Henkel told Fangoria that he'd written well-drawn characters he would feel empathy for, but he has since admitted that he wrote these characters to be cartoonish representations of American teens, knowing that few teens are like this in reality. Viewers who weren't warned about that in advance found this to be quite jarring. The cartoonish style isn't exclusive to the teens. It runs throughout the entire movie. You can see it in the fact that Vilmer has a remote-controlled mechanical leg brace, or that his girlfriend Darla goes on and on about her breast implants, feeds the family, who were previously known to be cannibals, with vegetarian pizza, and claims she has a bomb located in her head. Now, the original script went even further with this. When the teens arrive at the home of Leatherface and the family, they were meant to find a local band jamming in one of the rooms. The band would be shown casually leaving the home later, thanking the family for letting them practice there. Now, if that had been in the movie, it would have been just as confounding, if not more, than the late arrival of a character named Rothman, played by James Gale, an actor who had to commute all the way from Houston. With bad things happening to a small group of people in one place, like in the first Chainsaw movie, Henkel wanted to widen the scope with his film. He wanted to tell the audience that they couldn't be comfortable with the idea that there is just a minor, isolated incident, because there is something far larger going on here. And so we have Rothman, a well-dressed man with strange symbols carved into his stomach, a person who gets around in a chauffeured limousine and seems to be a representative of the Illuminati. 
The director presents the idea that Leatherface and his cohorts are unwillingly working for the Illuminati being forced to show people the meaning of horror so they can achieve some kind of transcendental experience. Now, the writer slash director did not confirm whether or not he really intended the family to be connected to a worldwide organization or if Rothman had just managed to trick them into thinking they were working for the Illuminati. He doesn't like to talk about it, leaving it up to the individual viewer to interpret and come to their own conclusion. Now, a lot of Chainsaw fans have come to the conclusion that this Illuminati stuff shouldn't have been in a Chainsaw movie. And it is hard to argue against that. Hankel and Kuhn raised the budget to make the film themselves so they could retain creative control of the project. Now, according to online trivia, this one had a budget of 600,000. And if that's accurate, it means this costs 10 times more than the original. Production took place for the course of seven weeks in the summer of 1994 and seems to have gone rather smoothly. The finished film was shopped around to distributors, with the US distribution rights going to Columbia TriStar, but that wasn't exactly the triumphant outcome the filmmakers were hoping for. By the time the company started planning the release, Matthew McConaughey had already been cast in the high-profile John Grisham adaptation, A Time to Kill, and soon after, Renee Zellweger was cast alongside Tom Cruise and Jerry Maguire. So Columbia TriStar decided to wait until after those movies were released so they can take advantage of Chainsaw 4's unexpected star power. Now the problem was, McConaughey had signed with Creative Artist Agency. And the filmmakers alleged that the CAA pressured Columbia TriStar to bury the film because McConaughey's representatives saw it as an improper exploitation of his success. But at the same time, wouldn't you do the same? Now whatever the holdup was, it led to multiple lawsuits. Even though Henkel and Kuhn held the majority of Chainsaw rights, they still had to option the right to make a sequel, just like Canon and New Line had done, because it was up to the trustee, attorney Charles Grigson, to make the final decision for the franchise. When the film hadn't been released by mid-97, Grigson sued TriStar and the production companies for breach of the distribution agreement. Now, Grigson eventually dropped the case when TriStar sought to enforce the arbitration clause in their contract. He then teamed up with Hankel and Kuhn to sue McConaughey and creative artists. Now, this was quite a mess, and the legal issues weren't even resolved until the year 2000. By that time, the film had already been given a limited theatrical release, as well as dumped on home video. Along the way, the distributor had decided that Hankel's director's cut needed some, uh, extra editing done to it. The film that reached theaters and home video under the title Texas Chainsaw Massacre The Next Generation didn't quite match the vision Henkel had for the return of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The writer slash director was not consulted as someone else cut six minutes out of his movie, with some of these cuts seeming to be totally random. The biggest loss is an early scene with Jenny, where we see that she is a creepy, threatening stepfather. Now, Henkel put that scene in the film to start off Jenny's character arc, we're meant to see her become stronger over the course of the movie as she starts standing up to the people who bully her. The experience with the homicidal, potentially Illuminati-employed family helps her grow as a person. Now, with the removal of the stepfather scene, Jenny lost an important part of her story. Other cuts are just a loss of seconds here and there, but they take their toll. Now, Chainsaw 4 isn't the most well-made movie out there, but some of these arbitrary cuts make the filmmakers look incompetent when it wasn't actually their fault. Thankfully, Hankel's director's cut has also made its way into the world, most recently with Screen Factory's Blu-ray. The real happy ending here is that Zellweger and McConaughey, despite what their reps may or may not have tried to pull back in the day, have both acknowledged the film and said positive things about it. In a 2016 interview with Yahoo, she said that she was so grateful and so excited to get the chainsaw job. She made lasting friendships with both McConaughey and Jax during the production. Sadly, Jax passed away in 2001. McConaughey may not have exactly known which Chainsaw movie he was in. He called it part three during an appearance on Jimmy Kimmel. But in 2011, he said it was a lot of fun to make. Henkel didn't feel compelled to make his own Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He was pushed into the gig. He had some interesting ideas. He had some bad ideas. And none of them felt fully realized in the final film. But the next generation does have its own quirky charms, and McConaughey alone is enough to make it worth watching at least once. Right, all right, all right. How often do you get to see McConaughey go full Nicolas Cage? Hey, 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 hey. 